Welcome, everyone. I hope you are well and enjoying a wonderful day wherever you are. This webinar is being brought to you by Icelandic Roots, a nonprofit organization to promote and preserve our Icelandic heritage, culture, genealogy, and history. In 2023, we celebrate our 10th anniversary, and we're pretty excited about that. To learn more, we encourage you to visit our website at www.icelandicroots.com and our sister sites on Facebook and Instagram. Please note that this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available within a week or two on our Icelandic Roots YouTube channel. Since it's being held in a webinar format, all participants other than the panelists are being muted and will not be visible. We encourage people to submit questions and comments using the Q&A function, which should be found at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You may do this at any time throughout the presentation, and there will be a time at the end of the presentation for questions to be answered. My name is Sharon Arksey, and I am a volunteer with Icelandic Roots, coming to you from Winnipeg, Manitoba, a very cold Winnipeg, Manitoba, <laughs> despite the fact that it is the end of March. Joining me is Doug Hansen, another Icelandic Roots volunteer who will be monitoring the technical side of things for us from Virginia. And of course, we have today's presenter, Alda Sigmundsdóttir, speaking to us from Iceland. Alda is an internationally known writer, blogger, and folklorist. His, her little book series, The Little Book of the Icelanders, among others, has a place on my bookshelves, and her Icelandic folk legends, tales of apparitions, outlaws, and things unseen was reissued in 2019. Born in Iceland and raised in Canada, Alda returned to Iceland as an adult. University studies in Icelandic folklore ignited a passion that has never dimmed. I understand that she is just returning or has just returned from a six week trip to Thailand. And we are grateful that she agreed to this virtual trip to North America for today's <laughs> webinar. Alda. Thank you so much, Sharon. And hi, everybody. Uh, just a small correction, I'm not actually a folklorist, um, but I did study folkloristics as a part of my degree. So I uh, have some, uh, yeah, uh, a little bit of a background uh, in academic folklore, uh, Icelandic folklore. And um, so I just am going to share my screen because I cobbled together some slides. Now, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, slides mostly, uh, I'm not a big fan of slides, but um, so these are mostly for me to remember what I wanted to say about Icelandic folklore. So um, just to, to launch right in, uh, there are sort of four main topics that I want to talk about. So the first one, is the Kvöldvaka, uh, because I simply think that it's impossible to talk about uh, the transmission of folklore in Iceland without talking about the Kvöldvaka, which was such an integral part of uh, how stories were shared, and it's just such a, an important cultural institution for Iceland and the Icelanders uh, and our literary heritage. Uh, I want to talk also about oiketites, and motifs, and please forgive the jargon. I will explain a bit what it's what what this is, and I promise it's more interesting than the word sounds. Um, and then adversity and trauma. So, as a component of um, the folklore or how folklore was shared, uh, what scholars believe today. So, from our twenty first century uh, vantage point, I think we understand folk stories, and especially the hidden people stories, a little bit differently than uh, perhaps our ancestors did. And um, so I want to talk about that. And yeah, so I, and I want to focus particularly on the hidden people belief, um, because it, it gets so much space, right, in uh, when we talk about 
uh, Icelandic folklore. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure everyone knows that uh, Icelanders are very often associated with the elf belief, and especially when it when, when it comes to Icelandic folklore. So those are the four main topics that I want to talk about. And I'm just going to go right on and talk about the Kveldvaka. And uh, for those who don't know, if you've uh, read this book, Icelandic Folk Legends, you'll probably have an idea. And even this one here, the little book of the Icelanders in the old days, um, you may have an idea of what the Kveldvaka is or was actually was. Um, even though we do have Kvöld Vökur today, uh, they're very different from what they were uh, in the past. So, as I mentioned, these are these were highly significant uh, parts of Icelandic culture. They were basically a national institution um, back in the day, so uh, in centuries past. Um, and the Kvöldvaka was basically a name given to a time of day and activity uh, that happened in the evening in the winter. So uh, as you know, uh, if you're watching this, probably uh, Icelanders lived in turf houses right up until uh, the last century. So actually well into the last century, they were still living in uh, these turf houses. And um, Electricity uh, had not yet arrived, obviously, and um, living conditions were pretty harsh. And you can imagine during the winter uh, what it was like uh, to be in this um, climate that we have here in Iceland uh, in the darkest part of, of the winter. Um, and so this is when the work was performed uh, that people could not do outdoors. So the summer uh, and the sort of spring, summer, part, part of the fall season was devoted to everything that could be done outdoors, making hay, uh, you know, um, gathering up the sheep and all of that. Uh, whereas in the winter, people naturally had to retreat indoors. And in the evenings was when they performed the work that um, could be done indoors. And I'm talking specifically about things like uh, working the wool. So carding the wool, spinning the wool, knitting the wool, uh, knitting, making clothing, um, felt, all of that kind of thing. And also uh, sometimes making sort of simple tools. And um, light sources were very precious and very limited uh, at this time. So, you know, today, obviously, we have the luxury of just flicking a light switch and we get light. Back then, um, they were not so lucky. And so uh, also, you know, there was not a lot of wood in Iceland. So it wasn't like they could have a fire burning all the time. Um, the light sources were mainly lamps that were, uh, and they burned fish oil. Uh, and then a little bit later, uh, they started using tallow, which is animal fat um, that they made candles from. Um, but these light sources were incredibly precious. So they had to limit the time that the light was actually lit or the lamp was lit. And um, what they did was that they had, they came in uh, when it started to get dark outdoors. And of course that depended a little bit on where they were in the season. Um, but it was sort of from 4.30ish in the afternoon, five, uh, something like that. Um, and that was what they called a rahkur stunt. And rahkur means uh, twilight and stunt means hour. So it was, basically the twilight hour. And um, this is when people uh, rested. So there was still a little bit of light, but it was not enough so that they could actually uh, use it to work or to do any work. So from five to six approximately in the evening, people tended to rest. So they had a little snooze or what have you. Um, at six o'clock, approximately between six and seven, um, that was when the lamp would be lit. And there was actually, there was always a ceremony uh, around the lighting of the lamp. 
And it was almost exclusively everywhere in Iceland uh, in, on every farm. It was almost always the woman of the house who lit the lamp. So it was like a, a ceremony that she performed. And if for some reason she was not able to, then she would allocate that job to somebody else. And um, there would only be one lamp in the Balstova. And the Balstova was where everybody basically lived out their entire lives. So uh, I'm just going to go up to the over to the next slide. This is a uh, example of a turf house. And you can imagine that, you know, a lot of people probably, I don't know exactly how many people actually lived in this house. My great grandmother was a housekeeper at this farm. And um, I would guess that maybe 10 or 20 people would live together in that small cramped space. And um, so there was one person then who uh, was next to the lamp. It was only one lamp and uh, and that person would read and uh, would and and the kveldvaka basically refers to so kveld means evening and vaka means uh, to wake or to stay awake and the kveldvaka was the activity of keeping people entertained so that they could stay awake so that they could do their jobs or do their work in the winter um, excuse me. So uh, the lamp would be lit and someone would start to read and they would read from a book or they would read from one of the manuscripts um, that Iceland is famous for. And I'm just going to do a little aside here because I find uh, this actually quite fascinating. Um, if you don't know, uh, the Icelandic manuscripts and the Icelandic sagas are uh, a really significant uh, contribution to world history and especially literary history. Uh, and what it means is that um, someone that we think was a man named Snorri Sturluson, who was one of the early settlers, um, sat down and wrote chronicles of um, the the Norwegian or the Nordic kings, uh, the settlement of Iceland, um, different uh, clans in Iceland, uh, the the wars and the feuds between them, and of course we have all these Icelandic sagas, sagas like uh, Njáli saga, Eil saga, Gretis saga. I'm sure you've heard of them, and. Um, so these were all written down on vellum, which is calf skin. And um, these manuscripts are still preserved here in Iceland. You can actually go and look at them at a museum. And some, some of you maybe have uh, done that. It's actually really fascinating to see them. Um, but other countries were doing this as well. And I know, for example, in France, they also wrote um, these sort of lengthy books on vellum uh, around the same time period. But there, uh, the manuscripts are, yes, they're preserved and they're all very, very pristine. So they're, they're very clean. Um, they're not too worn. Whereas if you look at the Icelandic ones, they're very worn. <laughs> And they're not that clean. They're actually quite, you know, soiled and um, and what have you. And the reason for that is that um, in these other countries, for example, in France, uh, it was only the aristocracy that had access to these manuscripts. So just the kings and the the, the sort of um, the upper echelons of society. Whereas in Iceland, everyone had access. And these manuscripts were passed around from farm to farm, which is why today they're so worn and um, yeah. And I find that really fascinating because uh, it shows or it represents how uh, despite all this poverty that the Icelandic nation had to contend with at this uh, time and right up, up until the last century, actually, Iceland was the poorest country in Europe. Um, they they were always incredibly literate, and they always had access to this to this literature, and this is the foundation today of Iceland's um, 
literary uh, or the weight that is given to literature in Iceland today. Uh, as many of you probably know, Iceland publishes more books per capita than any other country uh, in the world. So that was just a little aside about the manuscript. So anyway, they would read from a manuscript. They would read later, of course, um, there were different types of books that so they would read from those, or um, they would do something called a kvedast au, which means that they made up rhymes. So one person would say one line and another person would say uh, the next line. So they were basically making up poetry. And this is also where children were taught to read and write. And um, this is why, uh, despite this incredible endemic poverty uh, all over the country, everyone was literate. And that is all down to uh, this Kveldvaka, the Kveldvaka. And of course, that has continued to this day. Iceland has uh, zero literacy today. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to, oh yes, and of course, my point being that uh, folk stories, were told. And so the, the, the folklore was passed on and transmitted during the Kveldvaka or the Kveldvakur. And um, of course, these were oral tales that were passed on uh, verbally. It wasn't until much later that someone actually started going around and writing them down and collecting them um, on, you know, in written form, uh, similar to what the brothers Grimm did in, in Germany. So the Grimm's fairy tales. And um, so that takes us right to the oikotypes in folklore. So uh, folklorists, of course, study the transmission of folklore all over the world. And um, one thing they have found, or they, that they yes, that they found is that folklore is remarkably similar all over the world. And uh, despite the fact that there was not a lot of traveling that took place, uh, they, they share these common motifs uh, and themes um, all over. It doesn't matter where in the world. And I guess that's probably just because we're all human and we have these uh, certain themes that, um, that are important to us. And th these motifs are, for example, the, the hero's journey, where um, the, the hero of the uh, folk tale uh, leaves home, is faced with some kind of adversity, uh, has to overcome that adversity and then returns transformed. Um, and then uh, another motif or theme is these uh, supernatural adversaries and, and helpers. Um, magical powers is another one, magical objects, so invisibility, cloaks, things like that. Um, things happening in threes, we see this in all types of folklore all over the world, the evil stepmother. Um, and even though there was, as I say, not a lot of uh, people sort of moving around from country to country, it's really interesting that the same folk tale could show up in different cultures, but it would take on the characteristics of the culture in which it was told. Uh, so, um, for example, uh, one of the ones that I include in this book here, uh, I, my Icelandic folk legends, is the story of Gilitrut. And so Gilitrut was an ogre who, uh, and this is uh, very common actually in, in Icelandic folklore, there's a lot of ogres. Um, and uh, this uh, ogre comes to a woman who is living in South Iceland. She's a farm, a wife of a farmer, well, fairly wealthy farmer. And um, she um, was given the task of working wool. So she had to work the wool for a certain uh, specific date. Uh, and she was very lazy. So the date approaches, the date approaches, and she hasn't done anything. And then this ogre shows up and says, I will do this for you. And uh, the woman says, uh, you know, what do I have to do in return? And the woman says, well, uh, you have to tell me my name uh, within three tries. And if not, I get your firstborn child. So those of us who are familiar with the Grimm's fairy tales may recognize this theme as uh, very similar to Rumpelstiltskin, 
which is which was a dwarf uh, in in the the German oikotype of this uh, tale. Uh, but the Icelandic one is the one of the ogre, because that was something that, um, yeah, in, in the landscape in Iceland, uh, many of the rock formations often look like uh, ogres or giants. Uh, the wool, of course, which was so important to the Icelanders and still is in many ways, living in a cave in the mountains, etc. So, uh, yeah, so the, the Gilitrit is the Icelandic oilka type of the Rumpelstiltskin uh, tail. And, sorry, go next slide. Um, and that brings us into uh, the discussion of motifs. Mm. And these motifs that I mentioned uh, just now about <clears throat> the, hero's, the hero's journey, things happening in threes, etc. They, most of them are common to folk tales all over the world. And folklorists have um, mapped all of these motifs out and they've cataloged them and, and they all have numbers and you can go in and you know study them and whatever, look them up. Um, and they surprisingly found one motif that is unique to Iceland. And that motif is Dun, 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 drum roll. Those of you who have read this book will actually know that is the motif of the good stepmother. And I absolutely love that, that Iceland has this unique motif. Being a stepmom myself, I know that we are not all evil. Um, and so I've included one such story in this book. Um, the Icelandic Folk Legends book. And by the way, in the introduction to this book, I write fairly extensively about the Kvaldvaka and um, how folk tales were transmitted and how they were collected. And, and then I've translated uh, a bunch of tales, including these two that, I'm, that I've just mentioned. Um, so yes, yeah, that's basically what I said just now. I feel like I'm talking to myself here. I don't see anybody. Okay. You're all there still. Good. Um, so what I find very fascinating about folk tales, uh, and I mentioned this, um, how scholars view them today. And of course, they've been studied from our uh, modern vantage point. Uh, today, of course, we know a lot about trauma and trauma response and psychology and um, and all these different things. Um, and as you can imagine, and probably know, um, there was a lot of hardship back in the day in centuries past in Iceland. There was a lot of, I mean, the climate was, was very, very harsh. Uh, there was incredible poverty and there was an, an enormous amount of oppression. So Iceland was a colony for um, seven centuries and uh, first of Norway and then of Denmark. And um, but the oppression did not just happen from the colonialists. Uh, there was about five percent of the Icelandic population oppressed 95 percent of the Icelandic population. So the biggest oppressors were actually uh, Icelanders, uh, these the sort of elite the aristocracy, if you will, of, um, of Icelandic society. And these were generally people who were uh, in cahoots with the Danish king or the church, who were sort of high up in, um, in the church. So 95% uh, of the population was incredibly poor, was uh, very oppressed. Um, they... They were not allowed to marry until they had uh, earned an X amount of money, which almost nobody was able to. Uh, so, you know, they would spend the majority of their uh, reproductive years being unable to actually um, marry and, um, and therefore have children. And so there was a lot done. Uh, uh, having children out of wedlock, wedlock was um, very harshly punished. And um, there was a lot done in order to curb the population growth simply because 
you know, there was just not enough food to go around at that time. So uh, people really had no way of um, escaping their circumstances. And folklorists today believe that folklore, folk tales, were in many ways uh, the Prozac of the day. So uh, people could um, tell each other stories about, for example, the hero's journey, where the hero uh, goes out, overcomes adversity and comes back. And this was a source of hope uh, for people that somehow this, this might happen to them um, as well, or that, that things could possibly uh, be changed. And um, and the hidden people or elf belief, and mm, I use these two terms interchangeably because in Icelandic we use them interchangeably, hultefolk or allvar. They basically mean the same thing. And uh, this component of Icelandic folklore gets a lot of attention. Uh, and the foreign media seems to have this fascination with um, the Icelandic elf belief and this uh, fact fact that they drum up that um, Icelanders all believe in elves, uh, that we can't build anything without, you know, talking to the elves first and, and, and all these kinds of things. And to be fair, uh, this is also amplified by the tourism industry in um, in many ways, uh, you know, that they there are all these elf tours and there's an elf school and, you know, all this uh, people trying to, uh, yeah, get tourists in to um, make money off the elf belief. So the sort of um, the narrative is that, you know, look at those weird and kooky Icelanders. They all believe in elves or these, these hidden people. And um, let me see. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, I asked AI to uh, make me a rendition of Icelandic elves um, because, as some of you know, I share uh, things on social media quite a lot, and um, it's very difficult to find pictures of elves. Like if I'm sharing something about the elf belief, then uh, I can't really go on to you know. Um, unsplash or some, you know, royalty free image site and find Icelandic elves, right? So I thought when AI uh, came out just a couple of, you know, a couple of months ago, um, I decided to put in, you know, Icelandic elves. And this is actually what they presented me with. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, isn't that just, I mean, this is so representative of the way outsiders see the Icelanders elf beliefs, you know, that we all talk to these little diminutive little people wearing funny clothes and with pointy ears and that kind of thing. Um, and actually, I, I just have to show you, I, I then tried not elves, but hidden people. So Icelandic hidden people. And I got this, <laughs> which I thought was pretty hilarious and actually quite nightmarish. But I, um, the thing about the elf belief, and one of the, the reasons why um, I keep going on about this, is that um, today folklorists believe that the elf belief actually has a much deeper meaning uh, than you know that than even most Icelanders know about. And again, that they were um, that it was a way for uh, people to cope with adversity and trauma, and. Uh, one way was, for example, um, to simply envision these beings. And if you don't know about, the, you know, the hidden people, these were, uh, yes, hidden people. Um, so they inhabited a parallel universe uh, with regular mortals. So uh, they lived, you know, right alongside people and they inhabited uh, these um, rocks, big sort of rocks, boulders, uh, cliffs, sometimes hillocks. And um, so they were hidden from the view of the mortals, but they could see us so that they could see regular mortals, but they were hidden unless they wanted to be seen. So 
we couldn't see them, but if they wanted to uh, appear uh, to mortals, then, then they could. And so in many ways, and, and yes, of course, they're, they're, um, their world, their lives, um, their houses, everything was much better than in the mortal world. So the elves, they were not diminutive little green men, but they were actually very regal. Um, if, you, if you're familiar with the Lord of the Rings, um, the elves in the Lord of the Rings were actually based on uh, Icelandic stories of elves. So these were very sort of um, noble, regal beings, and um, their homes were uh, very sumptuous. They had uh, very high quality tapestries, uh, a lot of precious metals, precious stones, so a lot of silver and gold. Um, their clothing was a very sort of opulent. Um, they had belts with you know silver and gold. And um, their uh, livestock was always fatter than the livestock of the mortals. Um, the wool they gave was much better. So everything was better. And there was an order to life in the hidden world. And, you know, I can't help but draw parallels between, for example, reality TV shows that people watch today in order to escape. Right. So they watch the Kardashians uh, because in, in the Kardashian world, everything is much better. And, um, you know, some people may take offense to the fact that I'm comparing the Icelandic elves with the Kardashians. But I'm, I'm I hope you get what I hope you get my meaning with this. Uh, but if we sort of delve into the stories a little bit more, um, there were there are different motifs again in the hidden people stories and many of them involve missing children so um these are stories of children who are abducted by elves and um, sometimes the mother can see a hillock open up and her child walk in and the child is then gone or um yeah, and 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 so the stories are about the children being either abducted by elves or somehow walking into the elf abodes and then being raised in the hidden world by the elves. And sometimes in the stories, uh, these children will return as adults back to the mortal world and they will always have um, have been raised very well and their lives are very sort of auspicious after that. Everything goes well for them. Um, they enjoy good fortune and, um, and have sort of prosperous uh, lives. And today, mm, so we know that um, children back in the day, they routinely went missing. So in Iceland um, in centuries past. Uh, one reason was that children were made to go to work very early. So as early as five years old, so five or six years old, uh, they would be sent out to, for example, watch over the sheep and they would be alone. Um, the other thing was that uh, people had to work incredibly hard labor. So they would be working uh, almost around the clock during the lightest uh, season to, to get the hay in, to, you know, um, gather all that they could for these long winter months. And it was simply impossible for them to, to watch over their children all the time. So sometimes um, the child, children would just go missing, either when they were watching the, the sheep, say uh, a fog would come in, the child would fall into a crevice or off a cliff or into a river. And, um, and so they just, they would disappear. And so what parents told themselves in order to cope with their grief was that the child had gone to live in the hidden world and, uh, and was being raised by the hidden people. Uh, and, you know, these stories became very common. 
And um, they were also uh, a way to for people to imagine that they could transcend their circumstances because they were locked into this, um, this lower class, this, this poverty that they could never get out of. But perhaps their child who was raised in the hidden world uh, could transcend that. So um, that was that's one uh, aspect that uh, scholars today think might uh, explain um, some of these motifs in the hidden people stories. Uh, another one is the one uh, the the theme or the motif of the Luvlinkar. And uh, Luvlinkar, um, this is actually a word that is used today, and it's it's changed meaning a little bit. Um, today, if we talk about uh, a Luvlinkar, we're talking about a man who is very kind and gentle and, and like a good guy, basically. Um, but back in the day, Luvlinkar were um, the hidden lovers of mortal women. So there are these hidden people stories where um, hidden men become the lovers of, uh, of regular women or mortal women. And um, many of these stories occur in what we call seir, or what we called, they don't exist anymore. Um, a seir was a, a mountain dairy. So um, in order to preserve the fields around the farm for, um, for uh, hay, so that the hay could grow, the livestock, uh, which was the sheep, uh, was sent um, a bit further away from the farm. So up into these uh, remote sort of mountain pastures. And um, there, there would be like a, a dwelling that was constructed. And it was just a very rudimentary kind of dwelling. It would be like a, a, a turf, turf walls and sometimes just like um, wood or something put over the top, very basic. And uh, there was always a woman who was sent to the seir, and very often she would go alone. So she would have to spend the summer up there. Sometimes uh, she would have a child with her and the child would then be tasked with looking after the sheep or watching over the sheep during the day and herding the sheep back to the seir uh, in the evenings or later in the day so that the woman could milk the sheep and make butter or skir, which is this uh, yogurt-like um, uh, dairy product, and um, or or just have the milk, and this would be fetched um, a couple of times a week from the farm itself. So uh, the woman would stay up there all summer, and uh, and you could say, yeah, maybe this this was just like her. Uh, a lonely woman's uh, fantasy about having a lover uh, from the hidden world. Um, but there's actually another facet of this that is a little bit more sinister, which is that they sometimes came back pregnant at the end of the summer. And um, <clears throat> there were severe penalties, of course, for having children out of wedlock, as I mentioned before. So, uh, and these penalties were so severe that most people, most regular people uh, were not able to pay them. So uh, stories became constructed, this is what people believe today, uh, that uh, it was a hidden person who was the father of the child. But the other thing is that um, these women were basically slaves, like most people were slaves to um, the wealthy farmers and sometimes their uh, families, um, that many of them may have been raped uh, in the cells during the summer. And, um, and that was a way for them to explain without, you know, uh, so that they didn't have to point the finger at their employer or their well, owner, basically. Um, they said that the child uh, belonged to a Luvlingur, a hidden man. So um, this aspect of the elf belief um, is never, of course, uh, talked about today. 
and that is why I find it kind of, um, well, upsetting. Yeah, okay, upsetting. <laughs> It bothers me when it become when it's very sort of trivialized and you know uh, made sort of out to be kind of a weird thing uh, among the Icelanders and you know that we all believe in elves blah 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 uh, when the reality actually is uh, mirrors a lot of tragedy and a lot of desperation that um, that is such an integral part of our history and history of people who've had to inhabit this, you know, this, this island up on basically the, the edge of the inhabitable world, which at least it was back then. So, uh, yeah, I, um, that's basically what I wanted to uh, get across about the hidden uh, people. And this is actually why I wrote a whole separate book uh, about that particular aspect of folklore um, because I find that I find it both fascinating and I also find it very poignant and very sort of representative of um, the sort of soul of the Icelandic nation. Um, yeah, so that's basically what I have today. Um, these three books that are, uh, that are up on the screen here uh, are the ones that I talk about the, the things that I've just I've talked about now today in this webinar um, that I've written about most extensively. So uh, the two folklore books, the Hidden People and Icelandic Folk Legends, and then of course the Little Book of the Icelanders in the Old Days um, that talks about all of these. Uh, well, the context for um, for these. Um, yeah, this history that I uh, was just discussing. So I hope uh, you got something from this, uh, that you found it interesting. And thank you for uh, listening. And I'm open to your questions. I'll stop sharing my screen now if I can. There we go. Thank you very much, Alda. We do have a couple of questions already. And oh, we have more than a couple just in the short time that I was reading them. Question number one is from Rob, and he says, were the stories of the better world of the elves actually encouraged by the Icelandic elite, the 5%, as a substitute circumstance for the meager world inhabited by the poor 95%? So the poor would focus on the fantasy good life versus their own meager world? Good question. I'm afraid I don't know the answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that's been studied even. All right. And a question from Natalie. Hi, Alda. Thank you for your informative presentation. I love all your work. My question about Icelandic folktales is this. In recent years, Studies have revealed genetic links between Icelanders and the British, British Isles stronger than was realized in the past. And some scholars are highlighting possible evidence of the Celtic language influence on early Icelandic. Are there any studies on the strong similarities between Icelandic Hildefolk and the Irish or Scottish belief in elves? not only in the origins of the belief and the evolution of the stories as the result of similar cultural trauma, but also the strong link to cultural identity today. Um, hi, Natalie. Um, I, I don't know is basically the answer that, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, as I said, I'm not an, uh, an in-depth expert in these matters. Um, but I do know that the study that you, or well, the study, it was, it was a book, I think, or an article, a book rather than an article, um, about the Icelandic language being similar to the Celtic language. And I did post something about that on my Facebook page. Um, that's actually been debunked by a lot of Icelandic scholars that, that you know, that those links between the language. But, but you're absolutely right about the genetic makeup of the Icelanders and uh, 
that the Icelandic women are related to the Irish slaves or the Celtic slaves that were brought over by the Vikings. But um, I'm not aware of any studies that, um, that draw parallels between these two cultures. That doesn't mean they don't exist. As I said, I just, I, I didn't study this very in depth. It was a, a part of my uh, major in at university, but it was, yeah, it was only a minor, sorry. I'm kind of reminded of um, Hannah Kent's book and I'm trying to remember the name. Hannah Kent, of course, wrote Burial Rites about Iceland, but another book of hers is about, takes place in Ireland and it's about changeling babies who, uh, you know, and fairies or elves. And so- um, All the good people. Right, that's it. Yeah. Okay, um, we have some, some general comments about how much people have been enjoying. Uh, thanks, or talk, Alda, actually. Mm -hmm. And us, this has been wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, Karen says, Hi, I, live, I live in Canada. Where is the best place to purchase your books? So interesting, thank you for speaking to us. Uh, yeah, hi, Karen. Um, they are all available on Amazon. So if you uh, don't take exception to Amazon, to shopping with Amazon, they're available on the Canadian Amazon marketplace and actually all Amazon marketplaces. Uh, yeah, all over the world. Yes. And they're also available on your website, correct? Correct. Yes. Um, the ones on my website are actually, uh, so these are the hard uh, copies, uh, the, the hardback copies um, that I have, that I sell in within Iceland. Um, and <clears throat> so if you want to buy these, these are actually the best quality. Uh, you would have to order them from Iceland, but you can actually buy the eBooks and uh, not the audiobooks, unfortunately, but um, the eBooks from my website if you're interested in that yeah okay an anonymous attendee says my amma taught me to knit when i was 10. she said i had to be able to knit without looking at my hands so i could knit in the dark now i understand why she also talked about listening to stories in the winter evenings while her foster mother finished preparing supper yeah yeah, okay. I wonder, um, I'm interjecting here, but I I was wondering if the idea of the good stepmother had anything to do or any connection with the idea of, because there, were, there was a prevalence of foster mothers in Iceland. And I've never done studies about the prevalence of that in other countries, but mm -hmm. I wondered if there could be a connection somehow. Actually, I think that's a pretty good theory because you're absolutely right. Uh, that was, that's a very significant part of our culture is that so many families were dissolved, uh, unfortunately, when the breadwinner of the family died. So uh, yeah, and it's uh, actually a, a blemish, I think, upon our history uh, because in many cases it didn't need to happen but it was one way that the elite was able to secure uh, cheap labor. So um, yeah, and a lot of children consequently, because very often the breadwinner of the family did die, uh, especially the men, uh, because they went out rowing and we didn't have weather forecasts like we have today. So if there was a sudden storm or something, uh, all the men in one district could be wiped out in a single accident. And, uh, and yeah, so uh, there was a lot of um, foster fostering. Um, and I know that there were, there were bad foster parents uh, because essentially the, the children were auctioned off to the lowest bidder, which, which sounds really horrible, but that's basically what happened is that um, the district in which uh, they lived, they would pay uh, a stipend or, or a fee with each child that went to a foster home. 
and um, and there was an auction held so that the the farm that bid that that was willing to take the child for the lowest amount of money got the child. So in many cases, it was just like slavery, like being sold into into slavery. And uh, and there's a an absolutely incredible memoir that unfortunately has not been translated. Um, by a man who who lived during that time and um, describes these events in his life. Uh, it's probably the most moving memoir I've ever read. Um, yeah, where where this is described, and unfortunately, as I say, you know that it wasn't always good, but it wasn't always bad either. So, no. no. Okay, Patrice. Uh, says the fantasy good life is what we focus on today because we're oppressed by the elite. How much of your research is also based upon the power of myths by Joseph Campbell and man and his symbols by Carl Jung et al. Um, thanks for the question. I didn't actually do any research really. Uh, you know, as I said, I just took some courses in university. So I didn't really delve very deeply into this at all. Okay. Um, Harry would like to know how recently was the foster bidding? Um, yeah, how recently did it occur? Um, I think it was done away with sort of at the in the late 1800s. If I'm not mistaken, I would have to, to check though. But um, yeah, I think right up until sort of the beginning of the last century, it was still it was still going on. Yeah. Okay, and some other uh, thank yous and does Alda get to view all these um, comments herself? Because there are a lot of, of thank yous and complimentary comments. Can Doug, do you know or? Yeah, she can just if you just click on the Q and A. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking, looking at them now. Yeah. But I think they disappear after uh, when the this is closed, isn't it? When uh, when the meeting ends. I can uh, retrieve them and send them to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Okay, and Natalie was wondering what your next project is going to be. Oh, I have so many projects uh, on the go, but um, actually the one that I'm working on now is uh, an online course and uh, it's so much work. Uh, I absolutely had no idea that creating an online course was, it's it's like writing a whole book, but uh, it's in Icelandic. So uh, yeah, that's, that's my next, that, that's what I'm working on right now. After that, I've got a few things up my sleeve. I never have enough time to do everything I want to do, but uh, yeah, I've got some books that I want to write. Okay, great. Um, I think I have time for one more quick question that I'm gonna slide in. Um, in the blog that you started writing when you came back to um, Iceland, you talk, you call yourself an insider slash outsider insider because you know the language and outsider because uh, you were socialized in Canada. Yeah. So I'm wondering, does that insider outsider dichotomy, did it affect the way that you looked at all these folk tales? And has that changed? Do you consider yourself an insider now? <laughs> uh I wouldn't say that it affected the way I looked at the folk tales per se, but it absolutely affected my perception of the Icelanders today uh, and possibly the folk tales, I don't know, but um, I think I do have a very different perspective than most Icelanders do, just generally of um, Icelandic society, the Icelandic people, and that's essentially what is... Uh, yeah, what has made it possible for me to write these books uh, in the way that I write them? Uh, the Icelanders call it the guest's eye. So they say the, the guest's eye is always very sort of discerning and, and astute. 
And um, and I think that I can say that I have the guest's eye um, because I came into the society as uh, an adult and basically as a foreigner, even though I had an Icelandic name and Icelandic passport and I did understand Icelandic. And so that was definitely an advantage that I had that um, many foreigners who move here uh, as adults don't have. And it's very, very difficult to assimilate into Icelandic society, I think, if you don't speak the language. Uh, so I did that, I definitely had that advantage, but I was really clueless about so many of many things uh, that Icelandic people take for granted, that, you know, that, that they think everyone knows or, um, yeah, they, they, they take for granted that uh, all among them are aware of and because I was one of them you know um people assumed that I would know these things and I didn't know these things and I write about that a, a lot in uh, the little book of the Icelanders, which was actually my second book um and the one that is just consistently keeps selling it is it's recently been updated so uh uh yeah but uh as for the folk tales, I think, um, I mean, I, I came here as a, a guest with the guest's eye and I wrote the, the little book of the Icelanders and then I went back to university to finish a degree. And that's when I uh, did this minor in folkloristics. And that's when I started to learn about Icelandic history. And uh, I was really only dimly aware of how life had been uh, in this society, in this culture, in centuries past, whereas people who grow up here, they study these things in high school or, you know, throughout the, their um, educational system. You know, yeah, so they, they're, they're much more aware than than I was. Uh, of course, growing up in Canada, you know, I, I, I read Shakespeare and they read Haldor Luxness, right? And uh, so in that sense, it really, really opened my eyes to... Uh, what my people went through and, and, you know, how all of that, <clears throat> sorry, has impacted uh, the Icelandic national character today. And that's why I felt I had to write about it because I was just so fascinated and it really, it opened my eyes and not just about the folklore, but just about history and life in, in um, old Iceland in general. Thank you. Thank you very much for spending the time with us today. We really appreciate My it. My pleasure. Thanks to Doug for all your technical expertise. And thank you as well to everybody in the audience today. Thank you for spending the time with us. We hope that you enjoyed it. And judging by your comments, you really did. Um, I would remind everybody to check out Alda's website, uh, which was aldasigmunds.com. Yeah, correct. And um, I have enjoyed this tremendously. Thank you very much. Talk. Bless, bless. Bless, bless. Talk for the make.